friend, he, I remember in a conversation we had once, he said, you know, sex is a physical imperative. We eat, we sleep, we're cold, we put on a sweater. You know, we just think of it just like the body requires certain things. If you don't follow them, you don't live. Sexuality is a physical imperative. It is a very imperative, but nonetheless, that's just really what we're dealing with. We're not dealing with anything more um, confusing than that. It's just that we live in physical bodies and physical bodies have realities. Because we identify so deeply with our physical bodies, we are strongly impelled by the things that happen. Um, sexuality gets more confusing because it also has to do with our deep desire for connection our deep desire for love, and just uh, of all the senses after the sense of touch is the most compelling because of sexuality. Hunger is, you're starving, but um, when you read books like people in concentration camps and prisons, especially in the concentration camp, you know, when these people were near death, sexuality was still there, which was just so astonishing. <laughs> that it just, you would think that other things would just take over, but I think that's because the desire for connection is so profound. You know, what are we really working with? And then we start associating um, physical touch, physical experience with a much deeper longing. And, and what's happening in our particular culture now is because we're such a materialistic age, we just take everything on a materialistic level, but that's a whole different question. So the fundamental, because the way you phrase the question, sexuality and spirituality, the fundamental question is what is it that the heart is really longing for and what is actually going to satisfy the heart? Mm. And if, in, and we, we keep, searching for experience because we're not satisfied. And when we begin to feel all those restless longings, especially the, the loneliness, you know, just wanting to be seen, wanting to be understood, <coughs> wanting to have this deep connection with one person. Um, the last book that Swami Kriyananda wrote was actually a novel. He called it Love Perfected Life Divine. And it was a rewrite of a novel that had been written a hundred years ago by this very popular woman author named Marie Corelli who wrote about spiritual subjects. And uh, there were a few too many pages between the front and back cover of Marie Corelli's book. And also, Marie Corelli was known at the time for taking on big spiritual subjects, which were a little bigger than her actual understanding. But nonetheless, she wrote beautifully. There's quite a few books by her. If you're a novel reader like I am, you might enjoy finding them. The subject was soulmates, that book. And it was a little bigger than she was. And Swamiji felt the subject deserved a more elevated um, rewrite. So he rewrote the book using a lot of her pages. And in the context of that, writing that book, Swamiji said this, and it's, I, I, it's in the introduction to the book, I believe, which he asked me to write. He said, every human being longs to be loved, not only impersonally by God, but personally by another person. And it's just so simply stated, that's just the way we're made. You know, very, you know, true spiritual people are very sympathetic. They're not judgmental, they're not harsh very sympathetic from what I was saying this morning because they've all lived through this just like we're living through it. And then Swami said, it's not possible that God would plant such a deep desire in our hearts with all, without also providing the possibility of fulfillment, which is such a marvelous way to think about it, that this is something that was it's the way we're made. Now, I'm not talking about sexual union talking about why we seek sexual union is because we want to be loved. And Master himself almost never talked about soulmates. He only talked about it in one place because you just whisper that topic and everybody forgets about everything else and all they want to know about 
they're soulmates. So he only mentions it when he's talking about in the Bible where Jesus says, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder, which has become a dogma against divorce. But Master himself said, most marriages are not real marriages, meaning they're not soul marriages. They're just two people who, he's, he's actually quite cynical, who listen to a little romantic music and get in the mood. <laughs> so, you know, you have the most animalistic impulse, and then you have a more and more refined impulse. But the, the fact about soulmates, the way Master spoke about it, is everything in this world is dual, and he just simply said, it's a fact. Every soul has a counterpart. However, the actual soul union that he's speaking about has to transcend physical imperative. So if, if there's a physical imperative, you're operating on the materialistic plane, you're not operating on the spiritual plane. So what happens is people get very confused about romantic, sexual, passionate love, and where we live, we think that that's the biggest we can think of, so that's what we go for. But it's very nice, you know, it's the way we're made. It's very nice to be loved on all levels and all ways, but that's not the same as what he's really talking about, where we transcend everything. And before we merge with God, we merge back with our other half. However, in Marie Corelli's book, in Swami's book, is the other part of it, like how many lifetimes do we have together? And the story of, of, that Swami wrote, which is just a gorgeous story, is all about all the times that this, as it were, a man and a woman, although Master said, you know, when you finally have that final soul union, that it's not gender-based because it's not physically based. Gender is just a factor of physicality. But in the romantic story, it's a man and a woman, and all these lifetimes, when they tried to love each other, it just made a hash of it. You know? It's like desire leads to, to a wanting for fulfillment, and that fulfillment is not given to us, so we become angry, so from lovers we become enemies, and then we kill each other for a while, and then we realize that doesn't work, and so then we just, and uh, <clears throat> been there, done that, really kind of tells the story, doesn't it? We all know how love turns to anger when desire is thwarted. And so, on one hand, sexuality is just the natural beginning of the desire for union and the most accessible expression of the desire for union. It's also a magnificent, um, <laughs> the phrase that can come to my mind is dumbbell, but that's not exactly what I mean because nobody uses dumbbells anymore. You go to the machines and the gym and you push heavy weights around all the time. I don't because I die of boredom. <laughs> but, but per people do, you know, they push heavy weights around. And those and when you're trying to get strong, you you don't just put a tiny weight on there, because how would you ever get strong if you just were just lifting what you could lift? So we are in this God-created weird experience of having to learn who we really are, which is what I've been talking about. And physical imperatives are one of those things that we have to come to understand. And sexuality is one of the most compelling imperatives. For almost everyone, it's much better not to be celibate because it just creates too much pressure on us. You know, this one we use the phrase, Instead of getting lighter and lighter, people get tighter and tighter. <laughs> it just doesn't work. So for most people, and in balanced societies, people marry. In actual sane societies, they actually, like, it's all taken care of nowadays. Because we are, I mean, self-control is a very foreign concept. <laughs> and because we're so materialistic, see, everything comes back to materialism. We all just, we just try as a culture. The more intensely physical the experience can be, therefore the better it is. Now, of course, this is a joke. I'm not an expert, because I've never felt it was important for me to understand. But there's lots of subtle energies because of the second chakra and the 
the proximity to the lower chakras and all of that and creativity and there's lots of things that can be said. But the, the main thing to be said is physicality is not spirituality. But sexual union, if the rest of the relationship is used in an uplifted way, is an extremely positive way of grounding people's energy, of teaching us to be unselfish, of learning to give rather than always being trying to get, and learning to be faithful, to be restrained. These are all extraordinary important lessons. And God made us in such a way that we get to learn them. You know, sometimes quite painfully, we hurt each other more out of sexuality than almost anything else. But it's the almost always, and of course you, you can be perverse, but let's forget perversity. Almost always sexual misconduct is the desire to be loved. You know, we don't set out to hurt people. We accidentally hurt people because we're compelled. And when we're compelled, we do stupid things. You know, it's just, it's just the way it works. And we suffer, and sometimes we suffer a lot. But I think the best way, um, let, let me phrase it this way, the only way I understand to think about sexuality, I don't think of it as, I don't know really anything about Tantra, I don't really think about sort of working with sexuality or the way, let me think how to put it. I, I, don't, I think it was Master, but it might have been someone else. You know, you can work with sexuality and sort of challenge yourself to control it, and there's a whole tantric system, which is not, <laughs> this was a joke. These are, you know, I've lived with this all so long. When, when people were first learning about the concept of tantra, it became like a new pickup line in the bar. You know? <laughs> so I've been studying tantra. You know? <laughs> and it, it's supposed to be about transcending sexuality, it's not supposed to be about let's have more and more interesting <laughs> But uh, that we, we all laughed about that one a lot. Okay, but there is a genuine practice, I, I, more or less, but it's not a very elevated way in which to enter into the spiritual life. And you have to be really sure that what you're doing is a good idea and isn't just like a back door into something else that you are really trying to have instead of real transcendence. So I think the best attitude towards sexuality, and you know, lots of spiritual people just get so caught up in this. Swamiji said to me once, he said, one of the biggest problems within Ananda marriages is sexual sexuality. I, because I often said really stupid things to him, I said, that's not very original, sir. <laughs> you know, like, really, can we just be a little more creative than this? He said, but then when I would say stupid things, he would remain solid. And he would say, no, Asha, it's actually true. He said, because, you know, one or the other of the partners begins to think that they ought to be celibate and they stop seeing their partner as a friend and start seeing their partner as a tempter. <laughs> and then he said, and then it just cascades downhill after that. And Swami's entire attitude and feeling was, it's just a natural part of life. It's neither really as as important as everybody says it is, or nor is it possible to just put it out of your life. It's an imperative. And if you live in close proximity with someone that you love, the sexual energy is inevitably going to come forward. And, and my understanding, and this is a little bit of the gospel according to Asha, <laughs> which is a little different. I mean, I remember when I first when Swami first sent me out, you know, for, uh, out, that's how we would think of it, because we lived so isolated at Ananda Village, you would be sent out, <laughs> Swamiji. Sir, I know I should be loyal to Master's teachings. Of course I should be. And Master says that perfect celibacy, if you really want to attract a divine partner, you should be perfectly celibate, and so on like that. I said, I can't suggest that to anyone. I said, and then I said, because you have taught me, sir, that you have to suggest to people what they can do. I can't go out into the society that we live in and tell people to be celibate. It'll just make them crazy. And it'll make them guilty, and it'll make them confused, and they won't be very popular. 
I was up in Seattle, Washington in the 80s. I used to like be a circuit preacher for Seattle, Washington. I go up there to be a Nanda group. And, and these two girls, they happened to be from Poland, but that didn't matter. But they were just these two lovely ladies. They became totally infatuated with these teachings and with me, and they were so excited. And they bought all the books, and they bought um, whispers from Eternity Masters poems. And somewhere in there, it says something like, save me from the perils of sexual temptation. They called me at seven in the morning, <laughs> you know? And they came over at seven in the morning with this book in their hand and wanted to know if this was really what I was teaching. <laughs> and I said, well, that's the guru, and that's what he said. I never saw them again. <laughs> so I said to Swami, I can't, you know, I can't do that. I have to give people something realistic. And he said, well, of course you do. That was just his response, of course you do. It's like, we can't make a religion out of sexuality. That's, it's a desecration. It's just who we are. And, and as Swami often said to him, there's so many things that are much worse. You know, treachery and cruelty and hatred and all sorts of things. And this is just a natural part of life. Let's just integrate it into our lives, do the best we can, but for heaven's sakes, let's not make our spiritual life defined by it. Speaking of the couples, you know, it's just like, to just be this way. I know when there was a time in Ananda village when the monastery dissolved and a lot of the monks and nuns ma married each other and suddenly, bingo, we were a household community just like that. <laughs> it was very efficient. <laughs> 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 and there was one of the men, and it's sort of, the, you know, because it's a very small family, so everybody knows everything. He was just basically trying to be celibate in his marriage. Swami's response was, you can't have it both ways. And besides that, you can't make that decision alone anymore. You've drawn this woman into your life. And so this is not, you're not a solitary. You can't just say this is the conditions. No. If you're going to live that way, you have to live that way. But really, well, how shall I say this? God doesn't care. He really doesn't. <laughs> and I don't know. Religions get very confused. And we need to be very, very careful about it. Of course, we should be self-controlled. It's very important to be self-controlled. You shouldn't be compelled by anything. You should be conscious and careful and elegant and refined and generous and selfless. And you know, if celibacy works for you, great. And if sexuality is necessary, just live your life as it feels natural. And if it's something else is required of you, it'll come to you. Is that, is that good enough?